Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to uh, introduce uh, Golem. He wasn't exactly sitting in one of these seats, but uh, he was in one of the distance ed seats uh, a year ago. We got to know each other a little bit and then we met at uh, graduation and uh, talked about things. And, uh, and uh, I just thought uh, one of the really neat things about this course, I think, is that we have sort of unprecedented um, flexibility in the people we bring in. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk. Uh, let me do the, uh, the formal introductions here. Golan Bakhtir has been a software engineer at Rockwell Collins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa since 2004. His work experience includes signal processing and embedded software engineering in aerospace and defense industries. Uh, for those of you who are non-engineers here, we're talking some, uh, some pretty heavy-duty uh, mathematics we were discussing earlier in, uh, in keeping track of, uh, of stuff and making them go the right place at the right time. It's, it's hard. He's worked over three years on weather radar products at the commercial systems segment of Rockwell Collins. He also briefly worked on the commercial airborne navigation systems. He was born in Bangladesh migrated to the United States in 1998 while he was still in high school. He's earned a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering and in mathematics from Rutgers, New Jersey in 2004. And he's earned his master's from ISU recently in uh, 2009. We're so happy to have you here. Please help me welcome Golan Bakhtir. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. What an honor for me to be here tonight. Thanks to the professors for this great opportunity. The title of this class sort of gives away the three big pieces of the puzzle the world is facing today. And I'll try to focus my personal perspective on them. And my personal perspective could be very similar to some of yours or could be entirely different. So these are all relative. We can, uh, if you do agree or don't agree with any of this, we can discuss towards the end of the lecture. But let's get it started. Um, let's start with an example of globalization. Let me know what you guys think. Ouch, that got hard, right? <laughs> well, the reason I wanted to uh, show this video is that you can see how the East and West are blending. You know, Michael Jackson obviously represents West and Western music, and, and Bhangra, the music that you were listening in the background towards the end, that's uh, very prominent music in India and East. And when you put these two together, see, such, such a wonderful thing happens. 
That's globalization right there. That's it. We see it every day. We listen to it every day. We feel it every day, but we never think about it. So I figured that would be a good way to start it. And um, if you think about it, there are like two guys over there. If you have to pick one, they say, oh, one of them is Muslim. So if you have to pick the who is Muslim, who do you guess? Anyone? Bigger guy? See, that's the wrong thing. You know, he's Sheikh. He's not Muslim. And the thing about him is um, that they wear turban. That's the only thing in common. And their religion, faith, everything is different. And, you know, after 9-11, all the Muslims are being targeted. But unfortunately, all the sheiks were being targeted because they were, they were turban. But they have nothing to do with Islam. They're not even Muslim. And the other guy, actually, Michael Jackson guy, he's actually Muslim. And see this, you bring sheikh and a Muslim. They're in Britain. We're watching in, in Iowa. You know, it's a great example of globalization. You know, there's, uh, we're living it. Well, here's a brief uh, outline of the course. I mean, uh, <laughs> of the class that I was going to talk about, the lecture today. And um, I was going to talk about some of my personal background, but professor covered it. So I'm going to skip, for it for, uh, skip it for now, except just I want to mention that um, I was born in a Muslim family in Bangladesh. And I came to the United States when, when I was uh, still I was in high school and then uh, moved to Iowa about five years back. Um, as most of your engineers were here, so I figured you know, I'll talk a little bit about my work. Not so much, you know, but I'm an engineer, so I got to talk about some work. Well, I work for Rockwell Collins, which is um, actually one of the best companies to work for, for uh, newly grad engineers. Actually, it was um, voted to be one of the top company to work for as a new engineer. So if you want to talk to me after the class, feel free to stop by. I can provide you some information. And a um, uh, little bit more about Rockwell. There, there are two major segments of Rockwell Collins. One is a commercial segment, and another one is government segment. Commercial segment is basically uh, is the aerospace industries. We support all the airlines, Boeing, Airbus, all the major uh, airlines and the government segment, we basically support the um, U.S. military. We're, we're the defense contractor. So point to note here uh, that basically if you want to serve the country or serve uh, defense, you can join Rockwell too. Um, okay, next. When I was um, preparing for this lecture, I was uh, going through some books and uh, um, I don't know whether you guys know about Muhammad Yunus. Uh, I brought two of his books there. Uh, by the way, I'm going to give this away, end of the lecture, uh, for uh, two best questions. So, save your questions. These two books. He won Nobel Prize like a couple of years ago. Um, he's, a, he's an economist, but he won the Nobel Prize on peace. And I'm going to get to some of his more work later on. And you must have heard of uh, Professor Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Sachs from uh, Columbia University. He has done a lot of work, uh, uh, especially on poverty and uh, macroeconomics worldwide. And I believe these are your uh, assigned texts, and um, I really like them. And Fred Zakaria, he, uh, he makes a lot of sense. Do you guys watch the uh, GPS 360? Is that GPS 360 in, in Sunday? every Sunday on CNN. And Thomas Friedman, he has very good concepts, and I really like him. But as an engineer, sometimes like, you know, I stumble what he says. Uh, one of the things he says is that you can do anything anywhere in the world. But sometimes, you know, as an engineer, face-to-face -face interaction talks a lot. But he has a lot of good points. So these are, I find it pretty amazing books. So I figured I'd just share with them. Does anyone recognize this? Well, I'll give you a hint. The picture on the left, that's the portrait. Uh, that's a painter. Uh, the painter is from Iowa.
Can anyone take a guess? There you go, Grant Wood. So what they did, they made a sculpture in Chicago. The sculpture in Chicago, they copied the American Gothic in there, and then uh, they added a little bit globalization twist to it. Look at the look at the suitcase. Look at the suitcase, and there is a little tag there. Actually, it's not that little. It's pretty big. Dhaka, Bangladesh. So it's saying that this couple, Midwest couple, went to Dhaka, Bangladesh, and not only that, they went to Shanghai, India, other places. So I find it is like a a little interesting because that's my hometown, Taka Bangla. That's where I grew up. That's where I was born. So, um, I mean, here we are in Midwest, and I see something that relates to my hometown and in Iowa. So I thought that would be a good symbol of globalization. You know, it's here in Midwest. So. I'm going to try to focus, see, talk about globalization from very briefly from two perspectives. One is my personal perspectives, and another is uh, from an engineer perspective. And most of you are engineers, so I'll try to focus on them slightly. Um, so I try to figure out that, okay, how many people I know from different countries or different per parts of the world? So I went online, logged into Facebook. Do all of you have Facebook accounts, right? So. You know, I try to see that where are all these people. Roughly, this is like a rough estimate. I just put it in there. And I have only 500 friends, you know. Some of you probably have like a couple thousand, I know for sure, st for uh, college students. But some of these are my relatives, my friends that I went to elementary school, middle school, high school, college. They're different parts of the world right now. And, um, I have relatives and extended relatives who currently live in Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, England, Bangladesh, and United States. I have friends that I went to school, college. They're currently located in Australia, Canada, England, Finland, Germany, and different parts of the United States. So, I mean, I don't know what's the best way to keep in touch with them. You know, email? Yeah, email, but it's still pretty tough. But that possible. Cell phone, that gets a little complicated if you want to call uh, Finland. You know, I don't know what's the cheapest calling card there. But Facebook, any or MySpace or Twitter, any, any networking sites. You know, these are bringing us globalization to on our you know, hand. Like, you know, if you have like one of those Blackberries or iPhone, and you can talk to anyone, any part of the world right now. So that's, that's a little piece of globalization in my personal life. Next thing, as an um, engineer's perspective. I worked for a weather radar previously at Rockwell Corrins. So our radar works really great with North American weather because the weather is developed, designed, everything over here. We use the model in North American weather. But our market grew a lot bigger. And we start selling all these radars um, you know, rest of the world. But we are start having problems. So because we soon we realize that the weather models in different parts of the world are different. But when our market grew, our product needed to uh, make some adjustment. So what we did, we sent like a group of engineers, you know, put them in a flight, and you know, they went all around the world, collected data, started a um, different data models, weather models that we incorporate in our radar, and we can sell our weather radar in anywhere in the world right now. So as an engineer, we needed to um, uh, put focus on how to, you know, how to accommodate all this global market. And that was not even too long ago, like two, three years ago, and I was, I was working in there. Um, nowadays, this is more and more common when you were designing any product as an engineer. We have to keep in mind whether the design going to work well just in the United States or is it suitable for the rest of the world as well. I worked in GPS, so, I, well, I do still work on GPS. Is the GPS that I'm designing right now, will it be able to collect signals any part of the world or just in North America? 
it gets a little complicated when, you, when you're traveling uh, in Africa or, or say some part of Asia. You know, that your GPS may not work exactly how it works in the United States, but we have to you know, think about it as an engineer. And all of you are gonna be engineers, or, or actually some of you are gonna be engineers, so you have to keep that in mind. Say if you design a circuit board, you have to remember whether your circuit board is going to um, survive the extreme heat in the mi Middle East. Or uh, the airplane th that you're going to design, you have to keep in mind that whether it can handle the mass population in uh, India and China. They have a huge demand. You know, we're seeing the aerospace industry is going down. But the population is not. Their demand is not. So we have to figure out a way. And this is our challenge. You know, you, Guys are going to enter the workforce. You have to figure out how to handle that. Well, so here is the elephant in the room. How can we achieve successful globalization? You know, what, what do we have to be globalized? We all understand that this is the age of globalization, but what can we do? You know, what else we need to understand? If we're going to resolve many of the problems that the world is facing today in terms of globalization, we have to bridge some major gaps. I'll try to bring some perspective from being grown up in developing Muslim country and now being part of American fabric. There are, f there are five major gaps that we need to bridge immediately if you want to dominate the 21st century with prosperity. So the rest of my lecture is going to be talking about these five different gaps. First gap, the gap between the poor and the rich. The gaps among understanding cultures. Gaps among understanding different religious faiths. Gaps among understanding generations. Gaps among understanding races. I'm not saying that this, all, this five are the only ones that we need to work on, but this is the five are major ones we immediately have to start working on. And can anyone tell me what is the number one cause of terrorism in the world today? Any guess? There you go. Easy. So, someone who has nothing to lose in life, that person is so poor, cannot feed himself, cannot feed his children, cannot feed his wife, that person could be the most dangerous person in the world. He could be more dangerous than any military that you can think of. You know, he could be dangerous than any weapons that he can think of because he himself is a weapon. weapon. One of the great examples I, I was thinking of, well, well, this is a simple example. Actually, I don't know what would be the great example. The Somalian pirates. You know, we heard this time, like we're describing that, oh, the, the Somalian pirates are doing this and that. You know, whatever they're doing, they're doing terrible things. But... I almost feel like this is almost like glorifying them, telling, calling them even pirates. This guy's way about, like, the Somalian people, average weight would be probably like 100, 110, like half the weight of Americans. Like, I weigh probably double. You know, that's the average weight in America. So how could he even call them pirates? You know, these guys are so weak. They're uh, out of food. You know, they're constant hunger. It's... You know, they have been picking this almost as their profession, out of desperation. Now, this piracy can be described as a form of terrorism. Now you tell me, what would be the best way to stop this type of terrorism? Should we attack Somalia and kill all these pilots? Will that exhaust the sources of pirates or the terrorists? Or should we rather help Somalia not to be a failed state anymore? Should it help them to be technologically advanced so that they can form 
in a more uh, productive way, and they can be sufficient in food. I really haven't heard any plan about that. You know, we've been trying to solve the world problems, but I don't know how much it will cost for us to support this uh, program where we can get the Somalians to be involved more in uh, producti uh, food production and more constructive work. Now, the question is that, wait, why should we help them anyway? We actually need to help them, not only for humanitarian reasons, but also as the best anti-terrorism technique. We can think of any anti-terrorism technique, but they're always loophole. But when you give someone hope, when you tell that person that your family will be taken care of, they're gonna have food like twice a day. By the way, a lot of the people in the world, they eat only twice a day. You know, we think that three meals in a Western world, that's a, that's a need, but, well, unless you're college students, then you can survive off maybe one or two. But, um, so if you give them that hope, you know, they, it will change. You know, they, this, this um, sources of terrorism will reduce. I picked Somalia because it's a simple way to explain. There are other countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Egypt. These are more complicated cases and um, it will require a lot of detailed explanation. But there are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of similarities to it. Like, I'm from Bangladesh, but you would, Bangladesh is one of the biggest Muslim countries in the world. But you would not hear a lot of terrorists from Bangladesh. But because one of the things is that it's not too long ago they were below the poverty line. They lifted themselves up. And one of the reasons is this guy. He won the Nobel Prize. You know, and this is doable. This is the thing we're talking about. It's not a fantasy. It's not a dreamland. It's not, it's not something we just write about or dream about. This is doable. It's been done. It's been proven. Bangladesh is an example. We can do it with many other countries. So, now, we're trying to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. So how can you do it? You know, you know what, what do we need to do? And one of the things I mentioned in you know, Bangladesh and the microcredit, you know, he, uh, Muhammad Yunus is, um, he started the concept of microcredit. Um, basically, in microcredit concept, you, gave out a, you give out a small loan to the poor people, they take the money, start some sort of business. More than 90% of the time, it, you know, in that microcredit program, the borrowers are women. And many of, the, many of these women feel so empowered to be able to make a change, you know, to be able to feel important first time in their life, and they make the difference. You know, the return rate of these loans are almost 97%. Guess what? That return rate is a lot better than the return rate in the U.S. You know, we would not be in this banking crisis if we had a 97% return rate in this country. And some of the loans were there, microcredit loans, as small as like $100, $50. But, you know, with that small money, you know, you can go ahead and buy like a few dozens of eggs. You can sell it for a little bit more expensive prices. And then you can bring, you know, once, once this economic engine gets started rolling, you know, people can easily get out of poverty. And somehow we have to figure out how to do that. So the thing that amazes me is that all these women in Bangladesh, they're Muslims. And there's such a taboo around the world that Muslims, women are oppressed. And they, they, I'm not saying that they are not. I think you know, they're, the equality right issue has been, it's everywhere in the world. It's just not in Muslim countries. And, and these women, they made the difference. They lifted the country out of poverty just by themselves. And, and 
you know, that's, that's, that's the key. I think that's the key to one of the um, uh, you know, one of the ways to get out of poverty. So I've been thinking about it since, since, since you know, I started going to college. And I decided I'm going to do some uh, experimental project. I'm an engineer, so, and I had to do all my project on my side. So I decided I'm going to start, um, start uh, go to, go to like, a small, remote, poorest place that I can find in Bangladesh. And I decided to sponsor a few girls for their education. And uh, what I was trying to do, I had three different goals in mind. First, we tried to provide financial scholarship based on need and merit basis so that they don't drop out of school for financial need. Secondly, recognize them, their effort towards education. You know, for some of them, it's their first time they're being recognized for anything. So recognizing them, just saying that, hey, you're doing a great job. You're, you're, you're educating yourself. That's the best thing you can do. You know, that, that changes their life. That changes their vision. Thirdly, extension of second point is provide motivational support counseling services. Toward the end of this project, my concluding result from the experiment was that this project ran about three years. Um, so my concluding result from the experiment was that these girls are very much capable of receiving help. And the very people who are able to help them are not too enthusiastic about it. The project was based on basically the volunteering effort from the well-educated, probably financially well-off uh, youth generation in Bangladesh, as well as some financial support from some of my friends in the United States. And um, many of the time, it was as simple as giving them hope, telling them that they can make difference, and hopefully, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, we all can try to support something like this. <laughs> you probably can see this picture that well. That's uh, one of my good friend's wedding. It's in uh, Philadelphia. If you notice, all his five best men, all of us were wearing yarmulke. It's a Jewish wedding. But the interesting part of this wedding is that all his five best men are from five different religions. Uh, I think he's Jewish, Catholic, Hindu, I'm there, Muslim, and he's Christian. So I'm showing this picture to sort of focus on the issue that there's some gaps between religions or understanding the religions, how they work. This only can happen in the United States. I don't know whether I can see another picture like this anywhere in the world. And this very country, we can have a picture like this. Now, this proves to me, religions can coexist. Everyone's personal differences, religious faith, or any other concept of God, everything can exist as long as we're not, as long as we can like look through each other's barriers and limitations. So that's the, I think I'm gonna touch this point very quickly. Um, okay, next, let's go next slide. I think I was talking to someone before, uh, before the lecture that there is only one country in the world where the head of the government, the prime minister, and the head of the major opposition party, both are women for the last 18 years, except, except like two years of some, uh, some political issues. Can you imagine what country is that? You know the answer. So. <laughs> But um, that's a Muslim country. That's one of the biggest Muslim countries, Bangladesh, where I'm from. And not only that, 
There are, there are a lot of Muslim countries in this, in, this, in this world. They have elected women to be their head of the government. And I think probably Barack Obama, one of the first few person from uh, West to recognize this in his uh, uh, speech in Egypt in 4th, uh, 4th June. I'll let you read that, but basically it says that you know, he's recognizing that these Muslim countries, they have women head of the leader. I, you know, to show that, ex uh, to show that exact math, you know, I did calculation. You know, that's the population on the second column and the percentile of the Muslim and the exact Muslim population. So it shows that these are majority are Muslims. And also India, India has about 150 million Muslims, but they're, that's like only 15% of their population, so I didn't put them in there. So these countries, these countries, about half of the Muslim population, they have elected the leader to be a woman. I think they had other options too, but why did they do that? I'll let you think about it for a second, but what do you think it tells about America when we have elected a black president for the first time ever? That tells that we may not be in the post-racial era, but we can look through the barriers of races. And most of us, we're educated enough, we're open-minded enough to be able to elect a black person as a president of this country. If you use that analogy, oh, by the way, I'm not saying that there are not people who are biased for races, but majority are not. That's why he was able to elect. He was able to become a president. So what does it tell you about these countries? More than half of the population of Muslims, they elected the women to be their leader of the country. I'll let you draw the conclusion of that. But somehow the Western media steps into a little bit wrong territory. They portray the Muslim world a little bit defensive side. They're liberal Muslims, moderate Muslims, extremist Muslims, they're educated Muslims, uneducated Muslims. And I can ex repeat the exact same thing. Instead of Muslims, I can say Christians, I can say Jews, basically it's the same. But in the Western world, the way to put, the portray the women in the Muslim population, it's probably not the most accurate picture that you can get. So, next, next gap I want to talk about is the bridging the ga gaps of the generation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bridging the gaps of generation. So, let me ask you this question. How many of you have Facebook account that you have logged into last three days? Can you raise your hand? Let me see it. Nice. How many do you own an iPod or some sort of portable music device? There you go. Have you either received or written a text message in the last three days? Okay, that's my personal definition of millennial generation or generation Y. It says, in, if you go to the websites or different online, you're gonna see that they try to portray that as an age, particular age base. But I don't know whether that's entirely accurate. It's, I made up this definition, which, you know, don't, don't code on it, you know, don't use it in any, any exams or anything. But to me, that's the millennial generation, the new workforce, uh, the progressive workforce. Now, the issue here, the gap of generation, is that this is an upcoming workforce and most of us, we're gonna take over a lot of the responsibility from the previous generation. And there are a lot of differences, idealistic differences. 
uh, work ethic differences, values differences. You know, in our generation, we can look through a lot of these things. You know, we have a lot of good and bad sides, but at the same time, the previous generation, they have their own share of um, work ethics. So somehow, we have to understand how to work with these generations. How, you know, we can take in charge, we, take, we can take the responsibility, we can, um, you know, it's like a relay race, how we can take the stick and, you know, start running. And that's, that's sometimes, it gets a little complicated because when I started working for Rockwell Collins, I was, let me see, 22. And, you know, a lot of my co-workers are a lot older than me. So, you know, if I would go online and say, like someone asked me a question, I said BRB. Then I, you know, I would start talking to someone. So, after that, I look back, they're like, what does BRB means? You know, be right back. So, I mean, I was just thinking in my mind, you know, when I'm talking to someone in the IM, I, you know, wanted to tell my colleague that I'll write back. So that's the generational gap, you know, understanding. You know, in my mind, I have to make an effort to tell him, you know, what it means. And in his mind, he have to figure out what it means. So these are the simple things that we're, I mean, I'm talking about, but it, get, it can get very complicated. Get, it can get very complicated because a lot of you are going to enter in the workforce and you're going to see this entirely different world because it's, it's a lot of people over there are different generations. Or sometimes even same age group people could be different generation mindset. That's why I asked those three questions. You know, I think age is not the right way to describe a generation, but that's why everywhere else define it. But I'm an engineer. I can make up my own definition. So... So as a, as a millennial generation, or generation Y, we have to figure out how we can take the responsibility. Now, next issue I was going to talk about issues with races. It exists. But, but the, the bright side is that we can overcome it. There are There are always going to be problems. There are always going to be issues. There, we're always going to be looking for excuses to pass our ignorance. And, but there's a good hope that and at some point we should be able to overcome this. I'm not going to go too much details into it. But as far as I understand, the official definition of racism is a sense of superiority. To me, it is the lack of opportunity to learn. I'll not go too much details into it. I just wanted to mention because this is another, one of the gaps. And I believe you might have one of the lectures probably focused on race, right? Do you guys are, it's going to be sometime soon? I, I was just browsing on the website. I saw something. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And, um, and, that's, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't like to quote too many political statements, but, you know, that's another interesting thing that Barack Obama mentioned. The most segregated hour in American life happens in Sunday morning. Either you are watching football or not watching football. That's Sunday morning. You know, so, uh, I mean, we can ignore it. We can pretend that it doesn't exist, but it does. And uh, I'm not an expert at it. All I can do is try to be open mind and try to embrace the differences, try to learn from it. And as a generation, we can try to move on. So this lecture is also very self-discovering for me. So I ask myself, who am I? I'm an American. Who am I? I'm a Bangladeshi. And then, next thing I can think of, I think I'm a global citizen. And despite all the differences, 
It is our responsibility as a new generation to accommodate globalization. It's happening. It is true. It is out there. Globalization is the fact that we cannot deny. As most of us are engineers here, we have great responsibility to advance in technologies and facilitate globalization. The United States is sitting on the mountain of prosperity right now. If you can think of anything right now, the United States is probably one of the top countries. We cannot afford to be satisfied. We cannot afford to be not understanding. And most of all, we cannot afford to be arrogant. I don't like to read off the slides, but I'll read this one. Jeffrey Sachs said, Jeffrey Sachs, he said here, when a society is economically dominant, it is easy for its members to assume that such dominance reflects a deeper superiority, whether religious, racial, genetic, culture, or institutional, rather than an accident of timing of geography. This inequality of power can spread new forms of racism and culturalism. Many pundits refer Germany as a prime example of this, this type of sense of superiority, which ultimately caused both of the world wars. Back then, Germans were top of their prosperity, but two world wars cost them a lot. As American, I personally think we have to be humble. We have to be patient. We somehow have to watch the other country prosper and grow stronger. Prosperity is not a zero-sum measurement. If someone, if some countries gain prosperity, that does not mean that we're losing prosperity. We have to make sure that we can sustain our prosperity, stay where we already are, and try to improve ourselves as much as we can being, without being self-centric. And that's when the idealism comes in, that what America is based on. So, remember, I, I mentioned all these slides, if, if, you, if I can go back, that there are five different gaps I was talking about before. And I tend to go back to this, this gap again, that uh, the gaps between the poor and the rich. And that's, you know, if you get any homework for tonight, that's the homework. Think about it, how we can reduce this gap. And um, um, let me show you this video. Um, this is inspired by, this video is inspired by uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He's a professor at Columbia University of Art Institute. Um, he works with a lot of, as I mentioned, like macro, uh, macro credits and uh, poverty, this kind of problems. And the video was done by um, Sean Ahmed. He's from Bangladesh, but he grew up in uh, Canada and the US. Um, and actually, by the way, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with both of them, Jeffrey Sachs and uh, Sean Ahmed. But let's watch the video. Here, turn up the sound. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, indeed, we can end extreme poverty, but I have to tell the students the bad news. It's your homework. Malaria is a disease that is largely preventable. If you're wondering what these are, these are mosquito nets, and I'm giving over 50 of these while I'm here in the rural village in Bangladesh. 90% is understanding the problem having the will to solve it, and I'm sure that's true of everybody here. This is a good example of the kind of damage that is done by flooding. This is, used to be all farmland. The crops have been destroyed. It's a key. 
ऐसा तुम्हारा अब बक क्या नहीं This is one of those high-tech mosquito nets I was talking about. It's, this one's called Permanent, and it's made by a company called Vestigard France. We're here at a local grocery store. We're going to go get some water and then uh, take a lot of affected areas and see what comes out. same common human bond and i've yet to find a place in the world where you spend 10 minutes with generosity and you can't cross every conceivable barrier of class of race of religion of language nothing matters when the human spirit is involved thank you well <clears throat> that's that's a video in bangladesh by the way, the official definition of uh, poverty, they're, they're most of Bangladesh is above the poverty. So imagine how it is in the Sudan, Darfur, how is it in Somalia? You know, there are probably not enough people who are making those videos. So, you know, this is, this is what we have to work on. We have to figure out how we can bridge these gaps, how we can improve ourselves, you know, how we can make peace with ourselves and um, work towards a better 21st century. So um, I guess right now I'll open up the floor for discussion and questions. By the way, I have these two books that seriously I'm going to give you away. So uh, top two good questions. Anyone? I have a question. Um, you talked about early on uh, with the YouTube video with um, Britain's Got Talent, I believe that was. Right. Um, and you talked about how it just came naturally that the East and the West were coming together. Do you see that um, out in your work that culture and race are kind of ignored and everybody can come together without really thinking about it being a huge accomplishment? Um, let's see if I understand correctly. Are you asking that whether that might just naturally happen? Um, if globalization is kind of becoming more natural nowadays with technology and um, everybody kind of being more lenient and it just seems, has, have we gotten past a point where we don't actually have to put an effort forward to uh, be globalized, or is it still kind of in that stage where we always have to think about it? What, what I think that, I think we have to put some effort to it. It's not just gonna naturally happen, because then there are a lot of frictions. And friction could end up being wars and a lot of debt and it could be very violent. So the answer is yes and no. It will happen at some point. But then the question is how we can make it happen smoother. And that smoothing part will require some work. And you know, once, once we kind of like educate ourselves, all the gaps that I talked about, you know, once we, once we kind of learn that how to bridge some of these gaps, you know, how to, how to kind of reach out you know, not think that I have this particular domain and this is it. You know, I'm right, I have to protect myself and that's it. It, it goes beyond that. Even if, if someone is religious, you know, religion tells you that you have to reach beyond yourself, your family, you know, your, your, you have to go to neighbors. And any, any form of um, logical sense you think that we have to work towards it. 
you know, we have to make some genuine effort. And we can't just assume that, oh, it's going to happen. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit on my couch and, you know, watch some football. I mean, I love watching football, but, you know, we got we to gotta make, you know, get out there. You know, we have maybe one of the better things to traveling, you know, travel to South America, South uh, Asia or Africa. It'll open up our eyes. So answer to your question, yes or no, but we do need some effort to it. That's a good question, by the way. You're, you're, I'll put you on the top of the list right now. <laughs> I guess I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on individual impact uh, that, that you've had personally in with the sponsorship of the girls' school in Bangladesh, and uh, just some, yeah, like I said, some of your thoughts on uh, how one individual can uh, impact the, uh, the the surrounding world. Well, I mean, everything got to start from individuals, you know. That's we all have our own idealism, belief, thought, and, and then we form a group. Then we spread our idealism, spread our positivity among others, and um, um, so as an individual, when I did the project, it was mostly for my learning purpose. I, at the time, I didn't have the financial resource I didn't have uh, enough uh, structural background or uh, enough time to make it a bigger project. It was more as a learning project and it didn't cost me a whole lot on a couple grants. And, and I learned a lot, big deal from that. So you kind of have to make the, you have to be a leader then. Everyone have to start at some point. You know, that's when we start as individuals. And then the team, then the country, then the whole world joins, I guess. Does that kind of answer your question, or you're looking for a particular, what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, that, that does answer it. I was uh, just looking for your, your personal opinion on how important it is for an individual to, uh, to reach out in those humanitarian type ways. So, yes. Yeah, it's very important to, to stand up for how you feel. You know, that's, that's number one thing. I mean, others, nothing else can be more, more important than that. So it's got to start from individual. Um, you talked about the 97% return rate for the microloans in Bangladesh. Right. And I've read the book Creating a World Without Poverty. And Yep, I have um, that. <laughs> in, in that, he said that a lot of the women believe felt that they needed to return the loans because of the special support groups that they had created and how they um, how they felt that they would be failing their support group on how to use the microloans if they didn't return the um, money that was borrowed. And I was curious if you thought that this micro lending would work in the US even though we don't have a system that would quite copy. I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this correctly. Um, I think I kind of guess, are you, are you saying that whether that sort of support group would work in the U.S.? Oh, would, would the micro lending work in the U.S. because we don't have a history of these close tight-knit um, communities and any micro loan in the U.S. would have to be a much larger value of money? Well, uh, let, me, let me go back about microcredit a little bit. It's for hundred dollar over there. It's equivalent to like for if I give you like two thousand dollar right now, it'll be equivalent like giving them hundred dollar over there. So it's different scale. You know, obviously the GDP, the buying capacity is you know a lot lot bigger over there. With what you can do with hundred dollar versus what you can do with two, like hundred dollar here, and the support group part is actually is first time. You trusted someone, especially the women, with money, and and you trusted that they will change their life, their their kids, their husband, their families. They take that very seriously. As I said, I think women hold the key to success of bringing the world out of poverty. So they take that very seriously. 
They don't want to take that money and be lazy about it and, and not return it because they know if they return it, it's going to help one of their friends. The support group, the way it works, is that everyone has bad days. You know, everyone has like, bad times. Support group kind of shock the, uh, absorb the shock. And they kind of motivate each other to do better on things they need to work with. And it's like a study group. And you can, uh, sometimes I study well by myself. Sometimes it's better to study in a study group. It motivates you. And in the US perspective, the socioeconomic system is different here. Uh, I don't know whether you can exactly replicate uh, Bangladeshi model of microcredit in the United States, but there, I know there are a few places it's been experimented, especially in Chicago and California, and uh, it could be a different version of it. But right now, it's so easy for it to get a credit card. People wouldn't even appreciate it if you give them $2,000 loan. You know, they're not gonna, they're, you know, it's, 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 it's a whole different issue here. That's why we have this like credit card crisis, banking crisis. Um, it will require a lot of modification and possibly a lot more research with the socioeconomic culture. So answer to question whether it's gonna work in the US. I think um, if you read his book, he did mention some of it that it may work and they did some research, but I think I'm not knowledgeable to answer that it'll work for sure or not, but I think it will require some adjustment. Thank you. Um. Right here, up here. Okay. Um, I'm kind of curious, like the seven women you were educating in Bangladesh, like what exactly did you educate them on? Like what subjects or? It said seven women? Or I think it was like seven women or? Oh, yeah. it's, it's the every, every year for like, you know, six, seven, and it's like three years. So it's probably, I don't know exactly, like, like 10, 15, I don't know. But um, basically, uh, one of the main thing is that the culture over there is that the girls drop out after middle school. And one of the reason that their parents, uh, uneducated parents think that it's time for them to get married. And, and if the girl get a little, little older, it'll be harder for them to get married. So um, sometimes they won't support them to go to school. So one of the thing, you know, I obvious first thing, you know, provide them some financial support. Second thing is I tried to go, every year I would go back to Bangladesh. Every year I would make sure that I go talk to them. You know, it's in a very remote village. Uh, so I, you know, I would try to go talk to them. And there, I have some friends back in there who would try to go talk to them and, and, and try to keep them motivated and tell them that it's the best thing you can do, stay in school. You know, and when you look at their eyes and tell them that, they believe you. They will believe you. They will even believe you over their parents because they know you're not gonna lie to them, and you have no gain lying to them on their face right there. So that makes a huge difference, you know. If you tell them that, you know, if you finish your high school, if you go to college, there's a whole big world sitting outside there, you know, outside your small village. And they know it, but it almost becomes so blurry that it's like a dream to them. So when you tell them, they realize it. Oh yeah, that's probably true. That's why I think the face-to-face -face interaction it is invaluable. So is that can I answer your question or? Yes. Okay. Uh, an additional question: um, What organizations like here in Iowa State? I think you were from Iowa State, right? Right. What organizations are in place here in Iowa State that? give students like mechanical engineers uh, opportunities to help people around the world? Like are there? I think uh, pro probably the professor can give you better information on that. But uh, do you have an answer to that question? Do you know Engineers Without Borders and so on? Oh, over here, okay. We need to Get a mic over to this guy in the red shirt over here. Huh. See, I did uh, my master's off, cam off, off campus, so, you know, I like logging online, watch the videos, so I don't know all the details. 
Um, the two big organizations on campus are Engineers Without Borders, which if you have any questions about, us three are in it. Um, I don't know if you have any specific questions in general. Um, we work on sustainable projects for rural areas. Um, currently, we're involved in Mali, Africa, and Belize. Um, and then Engineers for a Sustainable World is in Uganda, and they do similar projects like we do. Um, I'm not sure who had the question, but those are the two main ones, I believe. Okay, I, I think I'm gonna give uh, the first book to the, the first question was just being brave in the, taking the first question out. I'll, I'll give you that. Still, I have one more book to give away, so fire away, any questions? I guess my question is like, how do you think the Generation X handled globalization and how is it being transitioned to the Generation Y? Do you think that the Generation X took too long to deal with this whole globalization thing? And how do you think uh, we as a uh, society can bridge the, uh, bridge the gap closer to you know, ultimately uh, have a better result than globalization? Um, well, do you guys read that book, Caught in the Middle? Is that part of the text, right? So he mentions that, you know, how uh, in Midwest there used to be all these industries, like auto industries and steel industries, all, all kinds of industries. And, and at some point, um, the Generation X, they worked really hard. They were the best workers that was ever there in the world. As a generation, they pulled together the best workforce, they made the best cars, you know, they made the best railway system, uh, best roads, everything. But at the time, the concept was more sustained within the local states, and, and that's when you're, you're gonna see the Generation X is very strong dominance of um, having a lot of the rights to, to the states instead of federal. Um, and, um, but they weren't entirely exposed to globalization as much as we're exposed right now. You know, in your phone right now, you know, you can text anyone in, anywhere in the world. You know, so it puts you in an entirely different shoe. And I think, I think Generation X did a fabulous job uh, setting up an example. But look what happened, like, you know, last few years, last, last maybe 10, 15 years, I don't think we're, we did the best job that we could in terms of making cars or, you know, doing all this, uh, you know, industrial work. So a lot of this work start, work start going away, right? Back then, 50, 100, uh, 100, 50 years ago, it wasn't that much possible to get those jobs, you know, push it away, you know, if you make a car in Japan, it'll take a lot longer to come to US. Right now, I, I bought a car, um, it was already, all the parts were in US, it's a Japanese car, they just assembled in like two days and send it to me, you know. So things have been changed a lot. So it's not so much that what Generation X passed to us, it's more of like what we have to adopt to as a Generation Y to accept what being passed to us and what are the changes we gotta make. So that's part of our job is to understand how this different generation works. And even if, a, if you work with Generation X, they have to figure out how Generation Y works. You know, like one of the concepts in Generation Y is that if you tell anyone, like you know, most of us probably in the same generation, that hey, get this work done. You know, in the workforce, industries, if you tell a young engineer to get this done, he will get it done whenever he wants to, in his own time. Even if, he's, he, if he wants to be at the beach, he's gonna go to the beach and he's work there and make it happen and get it done. But some of the concept would be in Generation X that they will be like 7.30 to 4.30, you know? So it works differently. But we have to understand that how everyone works. I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just understanding the gaps. You know, we can't let that, you know, boggle us. It's kind of, 
Answer your question? Question back up here. Um, I was wondering, on average, how much it would cost to um, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, no, to excuse. educate one of the girls from Bangladesh, and then I was also wondering what they've been up to since being educated, and what they've been doing with their education. Um, you're talking about my experimental project, right? Well, as I said, it was, it was an experimental project, and I did while well, I was in college, and maybe after I graduated, like one or two years after I graduated. Um, I kept in touch with them three years, and uh, I know I know they were still in school, and that's the only way you can you know get a, every you get like they used to get like financial scholarship every six months. Only only time you're gonna get it if you stay in school. That would like motivate them to stay in school. So I knew that at least when I'm supporting them, they were in school. No one dropped out in that particular group that I supported. And a few times when I went back, and I, I was pretty happy about it, but I don't know exactly what happened after that. I haven't followed up with the project. And this, this was for my, more of my learning purpose. And you know, my biggest lesson I learned from there that I can make a difference if I want to. And, and, and this, where, where you want to make a difference, and it is possible, and they will accept your uh, like progressive mind thought process anytime, and it works. It just happened to that I wasn't able to get enough volunteering support. I wasn't able to even like get enough people to go talk to them face to face, you know, even people who live in Bangladesh. So it got a little tough for me to go back every year and try to contact them. But we followed up only three years. All right, mine is a two-part question uh, that kind of go to relate to each other. And how do you balance the ever-widening gap between those who can't afford food, water, shelter, and those using the new technologies that exist? And how can technology be used to lessen poverty throughout the world? Um, well, the first part is that you asked that whether, how can you bridge the gaps of people who can use technology and people who cannot afford the basic needs. Um, one of the thing is that whatever, whatever concept that you believe in, you know, if, if you're religious or not religious, uh, if you believe in God or not believe in God, but everyone has their extreme um, self-responsibility in them. It's a matter of waking that up. And then, if you can do that, you can actually go step out your boundaries and you know, go help these people. And sometimes it's like there's a ladder of prosperity. You know, the ladder starts from the bottom. Some people are so below the ladder, they can't even reach the ladder to like move up. So it's our responsibility, who are on the ladders, to make sure who can't even reach the ladder to give them the first step. So people who have means, opportunities, and it's not, it's not because we're superior. It's not because we're gifted. Well, we are gifted but it's not because we're superior. So we have to keep that in mind and help those people who are at the bottom of the ladder at least catch the first, first step. And what is your second part again, the question? The second part was how can technology be used to lessen poverty throughout the world? Are, are you an engineer by any chance? Uh, yes. That's your homework. <laughs> so yeah, that's a... Uh, um, You have to figure out if you're a, if you're a, you know, agriculture engineer. I know Iowa State is a very good agriculture program. You have to figure out how to have better food production. 
and you can go to your lab and do some research tonight, maybe figure out a better way to do it, and pass that along to the rest of the world where they don't even have that opportunity. You know, so as an engineer, agriculture engineer, you can make that difference. As a mechanical engineer, you can maybe design some device that will help people, some you know, cheap medical device you know, that will help people to stay healthy. You know, it's basically whatever you do, like every little thing that you do, it makes a difference. But if we see the bigger picture, if we see that, you know, we're doing this for just not to just to make money, just not to make a life, then you can see that how every day just being who you are, you can make a difference. So technologically, um, it is possible to provide uh, genetically fortified um, uh, crops that can uh, solve the nutritional problem, to, uh, especially in Africa. It is possible to um, um, like try to connect people throughout the uh, throughout the world through communication systems. Like, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, you, you must have read that about uh, when Muhammad Yunus talked about how the cell phone, in Bangladesh, a person may not have food, but they have cell phone. You know, because it's so cheap, and, and that power of communication, power of technology, you know, they see what difference it can make. You know, for example, if a farmer needs to sell his uh, crop to the field, um, in the market, so he can call and see the, whether, how the market is doing, so he can take his, uh, you know, his crop over there and sell it. You know, that makes a huge difference. You know, that's, um, then someone, like, you know, radio, if you have a radio, people can listen to the, that, oh, the weather is going to be bad. In Bangladesh, a lot of people die in, um, in uh, tropical storms, on sea storms, because they don't even know that there's a cyclone coming, there's a hurricane coming, you know, there's going to be tsunamis coming. So just a simple technology, radio, can make a huge difference. So, um, technology, that's the answer, that's the, that's the second part, uh, you know, the title of the class, three big pieces, culture, technology, globalization. So these are very related. Can I answer your question? Um, in your talk, uh, you mentioned a little about uh, people of religion being classified into uh, fundamentalists and uh, uh, liberals and uh, all that and uh, more so it's uh, generally what we hear about people being fundamentalists is a lot about Islam because uh, we generally in the media hear about a fundamentalist Muslim or a liberal Muslim and that's what we generally hear. And have, have, have you heard of liberal Muslim we, in the yeah. media? If, if one is not a fundamentalist Muslim the liberal Muslim. No, we don't, hear, we don't hear that much about liberal Muslim. Exactly. But half of the population, Muslim population, they elected a woman to be their president. So that says that most of the Muslims are probably liberal minded. Exactly. But the question is, um, uh, being a fundamentalist is just following the basics. Fundamentalist is just following the basics. And being a fundamentalist, relig uh, fundamentalist in a religion is following the basics of that religion. And if somebody is a fundamentalist Muslim, uh, eyebrows are raised and um, generally uh, he's frowned upon. So though they might not admit it, is the media trying to imply that uh, the very basic teachings of Islam are wrong and that's why fundamentalist Muslims are frowned upon? Uh, what is your say about this, about the media? That's, that's, a, very good, that's a very good question. Um, well, Sometimes, you're right, the media inter, uh, inter-exchange fundamentalist and extremist. Right now, if you, after, after, um, after the presidential election, you're not going to see the word fundamentalist that much in the media anymore. It's extremist. And, and they're even trying to avoid the word Muslim and Islam. So fundamentalist people who believe in fundamentals. So if someone re really believe in religion and follow his religion, uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. But the way media use it as a uh, substitute word for extremist. So that could be confusing. And I think that's, that's the point you want to make. And I agree with it. 
like if someone believes in basic core principle of any religion, any religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, all this religion will tell you, help thy neighbor. You know, help the innocent. You know, protect the innocent. Help the needy. So, if that is the fundamental idea of religion, it's probably very good to be a fundamentalist. But extremist is probably when crossing the line of, of, of the limitations, even the religion that provides. You know, according to Islam, you're supposed to protect anyone who is unarmed. And, and, and you know, that, that concept could be, you know, fundamental concept. So, I guess the answer to your question is that, yeah, there have been inter-exchange in the media, and, but it's been, it's been corrected a lot recently, if you notice it. Does that kind of answer your question, or? But I agree with you. I mean, that's, what are you saying? I think it's time to, uh, this, this has been the most, uh, I was going to give out the last book. Oh, oh you got to give a book away. <laughs> uh, someone asked about naturally whether the. Did, who asked that? The question that whether the. Yeah, this was. Was who? Was that? Was you? I forgot like, whether the uh, globalization, you know, talked about the video that whether it will happen automatically or whether, whether we have to make effort to it. Oh, that was the first one? Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, I'll give the second one. I, start, I try to keep, keep track in my mind, but how about on the back someone asked a question? I'll, I'll just give someone who asked me a question. Who asked the question? Raise your hand if you want the book. <laughs> okay, you raise faster than him. So. <laughs> I try to keep track in my mind, but I start forgetting. Sorry about that. Thank you for, uh, for a wonderful evening. Please thank you. Thank you. I suspect he will entertain uh, individual conversations. Uh, either he'll recruit you to walk Rockwell or he'll get you to help the poor, one or the other. You can go up front.